So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. It's uh, Tuesday, October 6th, and we have a couple of very interesting upcoming talks with Shen Gao next week from Harvard, Joost Slingerman from Maynooth the week after, Sebastian Palku from Xinhua. And today we are very happy to have Zheng Han Wang. He's uh, one of the first people with Friedman and Kataev to propose topological quantum computing, expert on topological quantum field theory, and presently in charge of Microsoft Station Q, also a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So we're very happy to hear today about reconstructing, well, the title changed, I guess, uh, conformal field theories from topological quantum field theories. Cheng Han. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, so I think I need to share the screen, right? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks Arthur for the generous introduction and uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to talk about something I'm uh, really excited about for a long time. I guess it's also uh, a very exciting day for mathematical physics. Uh, I don't know how many times I think the Nobel Prize is given to, uh, I consider one of the very few uh, really a mathematical physicist. Uh, so what I talk about is actually not completely unrelated actually. Uh, I'd be thinking about uh, this kind of uh, EDS-CFT bulk edge correspondence. Uh, I always wonder about uh, if there's a relation between uh, any ions and the black holes. Uh, are they, you know, in any way uh, related? Uh, so uh, I really, you know, uh, you know, like to have questions, you know, on the fly. So please interrupt me for any question, clarification or comments. Uh, I think I will be very, uh, a very general talk, not very technical, so. So, uh, oh, I should say, uh, so uh, the thing I'm interested in is really uh, to reconstruct uh, chiral conformal field theories from uh, topological quantum field theories. Uh, or you can say mathematically to construct vertex orbital algebras from modular tensor categories. And then not very precise, uh, you want to say, you know, you want to study the edge physics with the bulk physics. So uh, the picture I show is basically the first picture. Yeah, not, I'm not uh, asking you to read the, the, the small uh, words. So the first is a uh, the real sample for fractal quantum hole states, we got a Nobel Prize in 19, probably 1998. And the second, the third is a most interesting it's a recent experiment from uh, Purdue, which gives the strongest evidence for any uh, statistics. There's another one which I, uh, Purdue is related to me, so that's why I choose it. So uh, there are many motivations for me to be interested. One of them is, for the last few years, uh, I became interested in mathematical quantum field theory. And it has a long history, and I think uh, we know uh, the best person to ask. So, and I think Arthur will give a talk sometimes in December if you are interested. So uh, okay. there are, I consider actually the mathematical framework is pretty good. You know, uh, we have all those different formulations. I'm not an expert, I'm learning the history. So we have constructive con quantum field theory, axiomatic and all the others. But uh, I've been working with the physicists a lot. So I like the, uh, to go their way, which is uh, before we do the most general framework, uh, let's understand uh, you know, the, the best examples. It, you know, yeah, this is more like constructive quantum field theory. So I will focus on 
topological quantum field theory and a conformal field theory, which are both mathematically defined. And also I want to think about quantum field theory kind of beyond perturbation and the classical differential geometry. Not that they are important, they are kind of relatively mature in a sense. So uh, for example, topological quantum field theory is called quantum field theory. I think that they are not quantum field theory in the sense they are completely trivial. And uh, they are not in the perturbation uh, story in a sense. And that's actually uh, kind of the most general framework for what I'm interested in. And another motivation is the motivation I got into it, which is uh, I'm interested in quantum church Turing thesis, which asks the question, you know, if there are many difference or there's a unique uh, computational model uh, if you use quantum physics. I think people all believe, uh, I wouldn't say, oh, that's a bad word. So I think many people believe there's a unique quantum model for computation. And uh, before I can address this question, I have to know how to define quantum field theory mathematically. That's why I'm interested. So that's uh, a second motivation. And uh, the way I want to do things is I want to start with quantum field theory as some kind of algebra. And uh, then uh, if you have an algebra, uh, then just by general philosophy, we have a representation theory. And then I want to formulate this as a reconstruction problem, which is you start with the representation theory of your quantum field theory, and then you edit things to do it. And uh, I think the example I want to understand is conformal field theory, which is if you have a chiral conformal field theory, and then we know the representation category in good cases will be modular tensor category. And then you can ask the question, can you reconstruct the conformal field theory from its representation category? And uh, I, when I give the title to Barbara and Arthur, I realized maybe I made the wrong title because it's not really about reconstruction actually. The most interesting is about realization, which is we have more modular tensor categories than we know, you know, can come from known conformal field theory. Really the interesting question is, can we realize those exotic in a sense modular tensor categories by representation category of some unknown conformal field theory? And I think modular tensor category is a good starting point because uh, they are basically in many, many places. And also I think there's a structure theory is starting to emerge and they become kind of my favorite mathematical objects to study. So, uh, Instead of talking the most general, so I will just be very specific and very elementary. So I will just talk about something called abelian anion models. And uh, they are basically the, yeah, since the simplest modular tensor categories, also they are the most uh, kind of physically realized because they are related to fractal quantum whole states. And uh, I want to use this <clears throat> to illustrate a belief which I have, which is there are lots, lots of modular tensor categories and the chiral conformal field theories <clears throat> we have not seen yet. And I think, you know, what we have seen, those from WZW model, all the things we are familiar with, maybe just measure zero. It's just a tip of an iceberg. And instead of, you know, we really need to uh, think about many new constructions to you know, find off them in a sense. So I will illustrate this phenomena, which I believe by even the simplest abelian anion models. And I want to formulate this as a search for exotic realizations of abelian anion models by chiral conformal field theories. And the example I want to use is the Monshai, which realize the simplest modular tensor category, which is the trivial case. So uh, I don't know the audience, so I don't know how many people know uh, the definition of modular tensor category, I will uh, recall, but I have not seen it. It's a very kind of complicated. Uh, it took me many years to be comfortable. 
But for this talk, I don't think I really need that much generality, although I will recall the definition. I will just give the simplest uh, example in a different way. So this is called the abelian annual models. And I really focus on the prime ones, which are the one not direct sum. If I don't say that with most of the time, I mean uh, pro prime abelian annual models. So a prime or it's a abelian annual model or a unitary uh, appointed module tensor category, they are the same thing. This is determined by a metric group. So a metric group, uh, in the case which I'm interested in is a pair. You have A, which is a finite abelian group. And then you have a quadratic form, a non-degenerate quadratic form on the finite abelian group, which you assign each group element the uh, complex number of norm one. And then you uh, make the associated by character by this formula, which is the multiplicative version of additive. And then you want this to be non-degenerate. And that's, that's determined a abelian annual model. So that's pretty much what I will talk about. Uh, and then you can ask the classification of those things. These are a uh, well-known mathematical object and they appeared in uh, many different contexts. So they actually can classify it. And uh, there are eight families. I think I will come back uh, the, with the same list again. So uh, there are eight families and they are given by this quadratic form. And I will rewrite the quadratic form uh, instead of using theta, also using its log version, which is Q. And they are given by, I think I can use a pointer. Uh, I couldn't find it, I say, oh, here, sorry. So uh, I also use the Q and the theta. Uh, they are basically the same thing up to a, a e to pi i. So uh, when I say, you know, a, a abelian annual model, basically I'm thinking up here, a finite abelian group and then non-degenerate quadratic form you can either think as a theta or as Q. And uh, then uh, I want to think about also lattice. And uh, here, uh, if you have a lattice, uh, and then there's this so-called discriminant group, which is uh, the dual lattice modulo the lattice. And uh, there's a well-known subtlety about lattice and the quadratic form has to do with a two. And uh, I hope this won't cause too much trouble, so I won't really go into it. It's a subtle point which uh, caused a lot of confusion and sometimes even errors in the literature, which is how do you go from lattice to quadratic form? Uh, there's a subtle two. Uh, so that's basically the mathematical object I will focus on. And then the question really I'm interested in is uh, if you have a metrical group can you find a lattice so that its discriminant group is this finite abelian group A, and then the associated quadratic form is the quadratic form theta. And uh, there are two versions of the problem. One version is any lattice, which is even. And the second version is I want the lattice to be positive definite. So this is pretty much what I want to focus on, which is you have a metric group, and then you want to find a lattice, either even, which is a very significant constraint, or it's even and a positive definite, so that its discriminant group is the finite abelian group, and its associated quadratic form is the uh, quadratic form of the metric group. So that's basically the mathematical question I'm interested in for this uh, talk. So when you say the lattice is positive definite, you mean the form is? I mean the, uh, you know, the uh, lattice, I imagine this as a subspace of the Euclidean space. So there's a inner product there. I want that one to be positive definite. Mm -hmm. Why my screen froze? Huh. I have a technical problem. Why my screen? Maybe I need to stop. Maybe you want to edit the edit uh, model mode. 
uh, what is, oh, the edit mode. Uh, where is the edit mode? Or maybe I need to stop the, no? S stop the pointer, maybe try that. Stop the pointer. I stopped the uh, anode did already. Oh, so okay. Why to stop? Uh, let me see. Uh, is there something I can stop? Oh, no, it's good. Good. Okay. So, uh, sorry for the. Uh, it's always embarrassing to have Microsoft thing not working. Okay, so uh, here uh, I'll give you the simplest example, which is more or less, you know, uh, I will, actually the first example is what I'm gonna focus on. So you take the first non-trivial group really, Z2, and uh, I denote the two elements as one S. And uh, then the group multiplication is the so-called fusion rule. And uh, the thing I want to focus on is the so-called twist. Uh, which is one i, and that's actually determining a model tensor category called a semia, which is the uh, a abelian model. And uh, the next one is the same thing for Z3. Uh, and actually Z3 has a physical uh, application. Actually this encoded the statistic of uh, fractal quantum Hall states as one third. And uh, the quadratic form is as you see here for Z3, uh, the group multiplication is the fusion rule and the quadratic form send the unit to one and the other to e to pi over three. So this is the metric group of Z2 and Z3. And uh, I'm basically I'm asked for realization of this of uh, using lattices. And the first one is on the nodes. You can just take the lattice given by the matrix two and that's a human lattice, it's positive definite. And the Z3 is al already not completely trivial because you cannot take the one by one matrix three because that's not even. So you have to go to a two by two, which are the diagonal is a two, two, and off diagonal is one, one. So that's the human matrix. And uh, so actually that's also positive definite. So those are uh, the, the easy ones, but uh, those are lattices. So I they also actually, uh, I will just say uh, what I'm going to do and as by the general fields letter metal work of a butchers, you know, if you have a positive lattice and then you have a chiral conformal field theory as a vertex operator algebra. So therefore those two NER models can be realized by chiral conformal field theory. You just use butchers construction to construct a vertex operator algebra but those are lattice conformal field theories. So I'm not really interested in those. I'm interested in the non-trivial, uh, non-lattice one. So uh, this is just to uh, remind you what is a modular tensor category. And you have seen it, you know, there's nothing uh, new. If you have not seen it, there's a lot of categorical things. So I really won't uh, go through it. So I will just quickly tell you what it roughly is. So a modular tensor category, you really should think about this as a categorification of some algebraic structure like a ring, and it's a basic ring. And formally, it is a unitary fusion category with a non-degenerative braiding. And the unitary fusion category is a, more or less a representation of some algebraic structure has very good uh, properties. Uh, the way to understand the axiom, it just says that you can set up some graphic calculus on the plane and then all the properties you want from the categories to make this into a topological graphical calculus. And if you uh, also can present this as a high school level, which is as a final set, some non-negative integers, and there's some complex numbers set about certain polynomial equations. And that's also give you a uh, definition of a unitary model tensor category. And we want to study them, so therefore, uh, you want some invariance of model tensor category. And uh, the way historically they appeared is that model tensor category are uh, used to define quantum field theory. And actually, uh, a slight different way to think about it, you can think about the quantum field theory as the invariant of a model tensor category. So you can derive from there 
all kind of algebraic data from the top particle quantum field theory, and then that will be environments of a moderate tensor category. So uh, I will just give you uh, the simplest uh, consequence of this, that every moderate tensor category give you a two plus one dimension top particle quantum field theory. So therefore, for surfaces, you get the representation of the mapping class group. For a pair of three manifolds with a link, you get this color link invariant. Uh, this is a dramatic generalization of the famous James polynomial at rules of unity. So uh, if you think about the modular tensor category, uh, they have a top particle quantum field theory. So therefore they will have invariance. And the one I want to do is the simplest you can imagine. You take the three sphere and you take the n naught. And then for the n naught, if you color by the objects of the modular tensor category, you get an environment. And that number is called the quantum dimension. And you can also take the n naught instead of realized by the round circle, you can realize by a figure eight. And the environment has depends on framing. So therefore this actually, if you divide it by the environment of the quantum dimension, you get a number. And by a theorem of a Waffa, actually this number is a root of unity. And that's actually called the top particle spin, uh, which is a very important environment for a simple objects in a modular tensor category. And they can form this summation of quantum dimension squared over all simple object classes. And this is the analog of the order of a finite group. I heard something, there's a question here. I really hope you know, people have questions to interrupt me uh, if you do. Uh, so, so this is the, the environment, the simplest environment the modular tensor category I want to focus on. And then there's another kind of more important one, which is you can take the half link and label them by two simple objects, you get a complex number. And that's the normalized entry uh, of the S matrix. And uh, then you can form another matrix by the one I had before, which is the top particle spin. And you organize this into a diagonal matrix. And uh, physicists always find this amazing that this gives you a projective representation of SL2Z. But for topologists, this is obvious because this gives you a top particle quantum field theory. And as I said earlier, if you have a surface, you get a repetition of the mapping class group and the torus mapping class group is SL2Z. So that's not surprising because of the top particle quantum field theory. And uh, the uh, kind of most interesting, one of the most interesting applications of a modular tensor category is to use this described top particle faces. Again, I won't go through the definition. I just want to say one way to think about not like the def definition, you, it's hard to make it into a precise definition, but it's very close. You can think of a top particle faces as a equivalence class of Hamiltonians. And then they have so-called elementary citations. Uh, this is particle-like. Uh, this can be modeled by a unitary modular tensor category. And uh, that's called the Anion models. So uh, that's actually a uh, one motivation for me to study a billion annual models, which is the fractal quantum Hall effect. And uh, there are, I think, roughly about 100 uh, different fractal quantum Hall Finney fractions discovered. And I got this in 2008 from one of the major experimental physicists, Wei Pan, uh, that he gave me the list of all the fractions at that time. I think there are a few more uh, discovered afterwards, but not too many. So if you look at all the numbers and uh, the most of them, they have all denominators. And uh, there are a few which have even denominators, which are listed on the right uh, lower corner. And uh, the conjecture of physics is that each fraction supposed to related to maybe at least one modular tensor category, which will describe the so-called anions in this fractal quantum Hall states. And uh, the current thinking is that all the odd denominators, except probably the 12 fifth, are abelian ones. And then the even ones and the 12 fifth 
it could be non-abelian, but that's still far from uh, experimental realization or confirmation. And that's pretty much what we do at Microsoft Station Q in the first five years. And uh, we want to confirm this non-abelian statistic in human denominators and 12 fifth, and then hopefully we can control them well enough to uh, make a quantum computer. It's still a dream I realized. So uh, that's actually leads to, uh, you know, the general thinking uh, started with many people, uh, in particular Xiao Gang Wen uh, from MIT, which is topological phase of matter. And for two dimension, two means space time, a uh, space dimension. So the two dimension topological phase of matter, most people believe this is determined by a pair, which is a any model or a unitary model tensor category and another rational number. The rational number is related to the model tensor category by a magic identity, which is you take the numbers I recalled earlier, which is the quantum dimension squared weighted by the theta, that's called P plus, and then you take the square root of the summation of the quantum dimension squared and that's magically a root of unity. And that <laughs> number C is defined only mod eight. And if you make this into a rational number, and that's actually supposed to relate it to chiral central charge of a conformal field theory. So a genus is a pair of a model tensor category and then a lifting of this C into a rational number, non-negative. And this identity P plus over D equals a, a rational uh, root or a, a, a root of unity with a rational C. That's actually a dramatic generalization of Gauss reciprocity law for abelian groups actually. So this is actually have a deep topological interpretation is one of the magic formulas inside the subjects. So um, I call the conjecture in quote because there is no definition of a topological phase in mathematics. So you cannot conjecture. So it's really a wishful thinking that topological phase is determined by the pair. And then uh, I consider this like an extremely interesting question, which is you can think about the bulk edge correspondence of two dimensional topological phase of matter. And it starts for me uh, from quantum Hall physics, which is the edge physical fractal quantum Hall this is determined by some conformal field theory. And there are recently, actually there was a conference just a day, maybe yesterday, uh, people give the strongest evidence, experimental evidence, that this fractal quantum Hall states have not be, have, a, have any ions, which are abelian. Actually, uh, it's hard to you know, say how strong the evidence is because you, they really don't, both of them, they really don't probe the anions. What they do is they probe the edge physics and they infer from this edge bulk correspondence about properties of anions. So, uh, you know, to me, you know, you can do as much as you can, but it's still like a not a direct confirmation. But on the other hand, we do know that uh, black hole get a Nobel Prize. So if you go far enough, people would buy into it. Uh, but to me, you know, if you really want to confirm non abelian anions, not the abelian ones, probably you need to build a quantum computer with it, which means, you know, it has to work as we uh, really believe. Otherwise, it's just a stronger and a stronger evidence because it's all indirect, not a direct. And there are direct proposals, but that's uh, very hard to implement. So that's my motivation to think about bulk edge correspondence because really the way to probe the anions is through the edge. And uh, so from there, I jump into the conclusion that it's possible that every module tensor categories can be realized by the representation category of a chiral conformal field theory, which I used as the uh, vertex operator algebra. And actually uh, Terry Gannon has a similar thought, but it's totally different thinking. You know, he considered this as a generalization of a Tanaki and Crane duality, which is uh, you can realize uh, groups, you can reconstruct finite groups 
uh, from their representation category, which are symmetric fusion categories. So uh, this is another big concept I won't go to, uh, which is the chiral algebras of a conformal field theory, which mathematically is a vertex object algebra. So I just put this slides on as to say that we have a mathematical definition of the chiral algebra in conformal field theory, which mathematically we call that as a vertex object algebra. And uh, this is a the uh, formal definition, again, is a big notion. Uh, I remember it took several lectures for somebody to try to teach us, you know, what this is. And uh, just quickly, uh, I think this actually fit into uh, the beautiful early days of conformal field the quantum field theory, which is the standard definition is that a quantum field is a distribution, operal value of the distribution. And the vertex of the algebra is basically a realization of this idea of uh, quantum field theory that you defined uh, this map from a vector space Y to some formal sum, which is the, uh, the mode of a quantum field. So this Y VZ is the quantum field corresponding to a state V. And so this is kind of, uh, to me, one of the best examples to understand what is a quantum field theory. And uh, the kind of, uh, you know, hard thing to understand is that the way it is defined is using the mode of a quantum field. And then there are infinitely many different multiplications. So it's a very complicated object. But on the other hand, physically it's a very simple notion, which is you insert a quantum field at a certain point, and then you bring two together and they will multiply. And the multiplication is defined by Borchardt. And that's given the vertex operator algebra. So, uh, and then uh, once you have a vertex operator algebra and a big theorem says, if they're good enough, the representation category is a modular tensor category. And uh, so just want to remind you, you know, I said that genus is a modular tensor category with a rational number C. Uh, that's actually a direct generalization of lattice genus. Uh, the lattice genus is a quadratic form, the group, and then the signature. Uh, that's exactly corresponding to a modular tensor category and with a rational number. So, uh, Tenkan, are I mean, you back in two dimensions or are you talking about three? I think uh, I all, I think I only talk about two plus one dimension. Uh, at this point. So uh, I think, you know, uh, I don't know you uh, talk about this, you know, I think this general idea of, you know, you insert a quantum field and then bring them together, uh, that's a multiplication. That's, I think it's true for any quantum field theory. I think there's a paper by Schringer very early days, I uh, think he tried to uh, describe this algebra. But I think it's very difficult to, uh, to make it into mathematics because uh, I think a vertex algebra works well is because of complex analysis. So we use a lot of properties of the complex analysis to make it rigorous. So, you know, I think as you know, you know, basically we try to make sense of OPE. So uh, I think the, the problem I'm thinking and I'm working on the interested is that uh, if we can realize every modular tensor category as the representation category of a chiral conformal field theory, which I use the definition uh, as a way away. And uh, there's not much progress. And uh, I basically, you know, I really hope people have suggestions. I, still don't know uh, something which approach that I think, I believe will work. Uh, so I'm really looking for the approach, I believe it, and that will make this into a mathematical theorem, which is every unitary modular tensor category can be realized 
as the representation category of a conformal, chiral conformal field theory, which we can either take as a vertex operator algebra or a local conformal net. I don't care which definition you are using, but what I'm interested in is a mathematical theorem. So uh, there are some no realizations. Uh, you know, the quantum group. Sorry, I have a question. Do, do you assume uniqueness here or you just want that there exists one? Uh, I don't believe uniqueness. I think actually it's obviously not unique. I really interest the existence. Okay, thank you. And the uniqueness, I think, uh, is a, this cannot be true because if you take the trivial module tensor category, there are infinitely many holomorphic conformal field theories, and all their representation categories are trivial. So therefore, there are definitely infinitely many. And I think the best we can hope for is this genus finiteness. Actually, I thought this is true, but then I realized that actually Jerry Hong already made this conjecture, which is, you know, take the example of a trivial module tensor category, there are infinitely many. And you take any positive definite even lattice, that will give you a, a vertex of the algebra, and that will give you the trivial module tensor category. But I do believe that if you fix the central charge as a rational number, uh, that would be finite many realizations. And of course, I can uh, consider zero also as a finite number. There could be central charge, there's no realization. But so I think that's, that's basically the uniqueness part. So I think the, I'm most interested in the existence. But if that is true, then I think the next one, which is the non uniqueness, is basically uh, refined to genus finiteness. And there are many, uh, you know, tautology realizations. One is all the quantum group ones, and they are given by the WZW model by definition. I think one of the real progress after that is uh, David Evans and Terry Gannon prove that all the double, I think including twisted doubles finite groups can be realized by, I think they probably proved the local conformal net version, I don't remember. So that that's also can be realized. And then uh, the abelian anion models, that's what I'm going to talk about next, that also can be realized, but I'm asking for a refinement. And then there are low rack ones, uh, which actually got me interested uh, because I classified with my friends all the low rank module tensor categories uh, that Jarrell Holmes had a graduate student who tried to realize them using uh, vertex operator algebras and which related to a, a few very interesting topics like error crashing code and uh, you know those things. And uh, of course the money, uh, the real question is how about the so-called exotic module tensor categories? like the Dreamfield center of the Hug group. And can this be realized by conformal field theories? And I think if they do, then probably they shouldn't be called exotic. And uh, it means they are just ordinary, you know, just like any other person. Uh, so uh, I think that's actually, uh, I strongly believe, you know, there are no special things about those things. It's just that, uh, we have not found the right construction. So uh, I, I, I do believe that every module tensor category, uh, which is a topological physical matter in the book, there is a corresponding uh, edge, which is a conformal field theory. Excuse me, Zheng Han, can I yeah. ask a question about this slide, right? Yeah. So, uh, so what is a chiral CFT for say, you know, double of finite group? Is this like explicitly constructed? Yes, I think that's, uh, that's, that's the David Evans Lagannon construction. It's a local conformal net. Uh -huh. In that and if you, if you want, there is a general indirect way to construct the chiral algebra. So there's a big paper, which by uh, 
uh, Kawakigashi, Longo, and some other people thought I didn't remember the name. I think many I cannot pronounce. So if you start with a local conformal net, there is a way for you to see in principle the vertex of the algebra. So as a physicist, as you are, you should be able to figure out the uh, Virasoro algebra. And uh, the analogy is the local conformal net is a discussion at the Lie group level and the vertex algebra is at the level of Lie algebra. So you just need to do that spiritual map and the log to go back and forth. Right. Thank so you. here for you the example, if you take the Torah code, uh, the realization is SO16 level one. So that's a chiral conformal field. Right. But let's and say a, um, not really in group S3 and just no. Yeah, they have, they have, I think they do orbit, they take some holomorphic, they do some chiral orbit folding. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I see. It's a generalization of what paper to way away. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to see them to, the, I don't want to see them to them. They don't, they don't <laughs> take this point of view, but that's my point of view. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> Now we talk about holomorphic. Uh, so as I already said, you know, there are lots of realizations. Of course, uh, there's only one important thing we don't know, which is uh, it's the Monshan realization uh, unique. Uh, so basically my propaganda is that this is not a isolated phenomena. <clears throat> this should be true for all abelian anion models. And I wish there is a appropriate generalization to non-abelian ones. <clears throat> so for these holomorphic ones is, uh, you know, the easy, the easy realization is just quote Borchardt, take any positive definite even lattice. And that will give you a holomorphic VOA. But there are interesting ones like the Monsha module. That's not a lattice. That's actually, uh, it's kind of like a beautiful mathematical thing. You do some construction, they're not inverse of each other, and then you are left with something non-trivial. So uh, this I will talk about a bit. So let me uh, see if this is actually one of the things we did, which is non-trivial, in you know, sense for abelian anion models, uh, which is the symmetry. So, you know, for classification, most, in the literature, when they say classification, it's not a classification, it's a characterization. So when I use the word classification, I really mean enumeration. And uh, we can enumerate <coughs> all prime abelian anion models. And we can figure out their central charge. <coughs> and we can also figure out their symmetry. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, <coughs> So for the odd prime, there are two family, we call A and B. And for the prime two, they are always special. Uh, there are six families. So for the odd prime, and uh, the two family basically, uh, if you separate into uh, the right theory, mod eight, they come in conjugate pairs. And for the six family of prime two, a, B, C, D, they are two pairs. And the, uh, the, the, representation, or the representative is the Semion theory and the Z4 theory. And uh, the most interesting one is the prime two and the E and the F. And the E family is a generalization of the Torre code. And the F family is a generalization of the three fermia. And uh, their central charge for uh, the odd prime is they are always opposite. So they are even numbers. So they can be zero, two, four, six. And then the, the others, the complex conjugate. And the most interesting one, the central charge, which are zero, when R is even, which is a prime power. And I think in your paper with me, you know, uh, some collaborators, uh, well, I think we showed that's a double. So that's not surprising, the central charge is zero mod eight. And for the prime two, the central charge is one seven, and then there are some zero. And the F zero is interesting actually. Uh, there, are, there are zero to four. 
So, uh, so I think the E and the F family are the most interesting ones. And uh, you can also try to ask, you know, what are the symmetry of those abelian anion models? And that's actually, uh, we almost uh, figure out the symmetries, but we really didn't finish one case. So for the order prime uh, quadratic form, the symmetry is Z2, and the physicists understood very well, this is the charge, uh, this is the particle, anti-particle Z2. And for the uh, ABCD, and it's very similar. And it's basically the charge conjugation or the particle antiparticle symmetry. And for the E family, which is the generalization of the Tory code, and we know it's a semi-direct product of Z2 with something. And for the generalization of three fermia, and actually we don't know exactly which group. We only know the order when the R is bigger or equal than four. So this has a non-abelian, very big symmetry group actually. So this is, and you also know all their relations among them. So this is a complete enumeration and you know, classification of a prime abelian anion models. So really there are nothing, nothing we don't know about the classification as abelian anion models. And then there are people who can write down the 60 symbols using abelian cohomology of Ellenberg MacLean. So I think they are really as, you know, you can understand as you uh, could be for those kind of things. And then uh, in terms of lattice realization, uh, it's already uh, done by Nicolin, which is a famous paper on integer uh, quadratic, you know, bilinear forms. I think he has a very general theorem which implied the existence of positive, even definite lattice for every finite abelian group called metrical groups. So it exists already there. And then there is a new proof, very short actually uh, by David Evans and Gannon, which they uh, using a construction lattice, mainly a complement, complement lattice. And they give a new proof, which is not well algorithmic. And the one I'm interested in this new paper actually is algorithmic. I really want to start with a metric group and then try to output uh, the positive definite lattice. And uh, we almost finished it. There's a one case which is good enough for physicists. If you have any problem, you just need to find some, you need to solve some elementary number theory question. But we couldn't write down the general solution. And other than that, it's pretty much a construction. So uh, now I ask the question, which is, uh, I think I maybe, okay, I think I want, just want to see the question here. I think I will come back later. Actually, Arthur, should I talk 50 minutes or an hour? Arthur? Oh, an hour is fine. Okay, okay. Uh, that's a little bit better. Otherwise, I think I have to rush. So uh, you can see that, you know, uh, they are all, maybe I won't talk an hour, we'll talk maybe uh, five more minutes. Uh, so they are realized by lattice, but I'm interested in non-lattice realizations. But that's also very simple. You just take some lattice realization and then take some holomorphic non-lattice. So uh, that's cheating. So I want to rule those out. And the way to rule out cheating is to use a notion of extremal conformal field theories. And the extremal condition come from kind of a, a beautiful inequality, which is if you give a genus and then there are inequality between the rank of the module tensor category, the central charge as a rational number in the genus and then all the conformal weight. So if I fix a genus, that means the rank R is, fin is fixed and the central charge C is fixed. And there's a minus sign in front of the sum of HI. And I want to maximize that summation and uh, given R and C. And that's what I would call extremal. And that will rule out cheating in terms of you just 
kind of product of holomorphic conformal field theories. So now I ask for realizations which are non-lattice and extremal for abelian annual models. So uh, I, I consider this actually could be interpreted as some kind of generalization of a moonshot. And I think this is a very interesting mathematical question. If a moonshot only works for this one case, I think its mathematical significance is way down. You know, as we in mathematics, we always want to go to generality. If this is just like a one singularity, I think, you know, it's very exciting, interesting, profound, but it seemed to be so narrow. So I think it's an interesting mathematical question to ask, is there a moonshine for every finite group, maybe a finite simple group or whatever groups. So uh, I think I will uh, speculate to propose at least there should be a generalization to the abelian finite groups. And uh, so this is basically uh, the philosophy uh, of this, you know, revisit abelian annual models. And uh, I'll give you one evidence that is could be. So the moonshine is about the trivial modular tensor category, WAC. So there's only the WAC cube. And uh, we know the moonshine is a non-lattice realization, which you start with the beautiful leech lattice, you do a simple current extension, and then you do a condensation and the two are not inverse each other, so therefore you get something not trivial left over. And you can try to mimic this construction for other finite cyclic abelian group. And the one I want to take is just Z2, which is the semion theory. And there's a beautiful theory due to Gano and other people that you start with a modular tensor category, and there's an algorithm for you to figure out the potential characters of the realization of conformal field theories. So I did this with James Turner when he was a postdoc at UCSB for SEMIA. And we found out one particular theory. Uh, I think I want to in possible risk against uh, frozen, but let me point this one out. Oh, maybe I will just say it. So if you look at the left, uh, diagram and the first theory of central chart 33. And when we found this character, and we realized if there is a realization, uh, this won't be a lattice. So that's actually got me very excited because potentially we are predicting a new chiral conformal field theory. After this has been studied for so long, it's hard to have anything new to say. So. Uh, this turns out to be true, actually. We do uh, have a realization. So we do have a very interesting new chiral non-lattice extremal conformal field theory. And uh, so Jim and I wrote this paper and uh, I barely know conformal field theory well enough. So I definitely not capable of constructing it, but there are plenty of experts in the world. So uh, this uh, lamb, and uh, Yamaguchi, uh, they heard of this problem. And uh, they uh, first, you know, they give us the answer quickly, said, yes, we can construct it. Then uh, they realized uh, it was not that simple. So, but recently they did again uh, using framed uh, theory which they developed for many years. I think they want to study the moonshine module. They want to really aim at the uniqueness of the moonshine module. So the way they constructed it is very interesting, is turning into a question about lattice with exotic symmetries. So the most difficult step in their construction of the conformal field theory, Jim and I predicted, is that a theorem of 4.2 in their paper, that they found a rank 32 lattice with the exotic symmetry and uh, I think physicists will be say it's a normalized Z2 symmetry. 
But the beauty of a 32 is that this goes beyond classification. So there's no hope like 24, you hope to exhaust it all the possible lattice. So this is why it's so hard to go beyond, you know, anything. I think the record of classification, the last time I checked is like a 25 or something. So I think the question I'm interested in really become a question about lattices with a lot of exotic symmetries. And once you have the symmetries, and then you want to mimic Monshai, which is the using this, gauging this symmetry, and then you condense the symmetry, and then you realize the construction both ways are not inverse of each other. And you are left with something very interesting, uh, which is our, you know, uh, kind of suggested Z2 uh, conformal field theory. So, uh, so I believe actually this is a general phenomenon. And uh, so I hope, you know, for every ZP, there will be such kind of uh, exotic, extremal uh, non-lattice conformal field theory. And uh, I think I said, uh, what I want to do is actually algorithmic. And uh, the technical tool is invented by topologist Terry Wall. And he uh, gave a algorithm basically from a metrical group to a lattice. And uh, I don't have time and I don't think it's terribly important for people. Uh, so I would just uh, tell you there is the algorithm to do most of the cases. So I don't want to say uh, before I end. So uh, as I said, I don't know any approach which seems to be uh, able at this point to me to prove the mathematical theorem the existence. But I tried uh, to think about the vector valued modular form. And I do believe this potentially uh, possible to give a mathematical proof. And uh, this is actually a necessary thing. You have to deal with vector valued modular form anyway, because I consider one of the milestone theorems in vertex orbital algebra, which is Drew's theorem that uh, the character of a vertex orbital algebra they are a vector valued modular form. I think this is a deep theorem, uh, you know, uh, for modular tensor categories. So uh, I will end with uh, speculations. Uh, so uh, I can imagine actually uh, several different approach. Uh, so if you give me a modular tensor category or a NER model, how would you reconstruct a conformal field theory? So uh, one way is to use vector valued modular form. And uh, actually there are two places you can use vector valued modular form. One place everybody who think about the subject knows already, which is the torus mapping class group is SO2Z. But actually there's another place which is you take the full punctured sphere, and the spherical braid group also has a connection to PSO2Z. So vector weighted modular form can also be applied to there. And then my thinking is that that might be able to uh, tell you enough to reconstruct the conformal field theory. So that's you know, one approach. And another possibility is uh, to use anions uh, you know, anionic chains. And uh, I actually also wrote a paper with my former student, Moji. Uh, I'm a little bit doubtful if this will work, but uh, it's definitely relevant. And it might also be a important ingredient if you want to do vector valued modular forms. And uh, I can also think about other evidence, but I think I will, it's all speculation at this point. I think uh, I want to stop here and thank everybody for listening. And uh, so we'll end with a, a interesting quiz for all the people here. Thank you. Uh, I look forward to questions and comments. I will stop here. Well, thank you very much, Jinghan, for a really interesting talk full of ideas. And I'm sure that there'll be many comments. Um, can I ask a question? Oh, of course. Yeah, so can you, uh, I have a question about the C equals to 33 um, a VOA that you were, uh, you, that you mentioned. 
Yeah. So, so you roll down the character. So if I understand correctly, this is some VOA with two modules and you yes. roll down the characters. Yes. So is it, I, I thought um, VOA with two modules are class, uh, can be classified by some modular differential equation. Uh, so I, I'm thinking about classification actually, uh, I think I know. Okay, when the paper came out, uh, we were completely confused. Uh, it's definitely not complete. Uh, so I, I was thinking about a very old paper by- I know, well, I know, I know. Uh, so actually I, I, I tried to, so Arthur, uh, I, I kind of lost my slides. So if there's a way for me to go back to slides, oh yeah. Share your screen. Uh, oh no, not this one. Okay, so here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you you have to me, share your screen. Oh oh, I I didn't share my screen. <laughs> where did where did they go? Sorry. Uh, There should be a green button at the uh, yeah green button at the at the bottom of the zoom window. The question is, I lost everything. Uh, you can I assume you cannot see it. Find the zoom icon and click on it. It will take you to the zoom screen, and then at the bottom there's an icon. Okay, here we go. Uh, I think what happens was I I go to my own. It, it has nice. Uh, yeah, now we can see it. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so here, uh, if you look at the inequality, yes. one half something bigger or equal than zero, mm -hmm. and using the modular differential equation technique, you can show not only it's a non negative integer, actually, it's a multiple 6L of some integer actually. Yeah, I think there's an L here. So the paper, earlier paper where they classified actually, uh, they are fixing some L. Oh. So it didn't really include the one which I was talking about. Oh, also that, also the classification using the modular differential equation is not complete. It's that if we are thinking the same paper, there are some papers missing the one which I pointed out. I see. Oh, okay. So, so this is pretty much like a generalization of the moonshine, which is, uh, you know, you find this, the, the, the way it's constructed is you, uh, you realize the coefficient of Q is a three, so there must be SU2 level one there. So you split off the SU2 level one, and then you see that what you are looking for is a particular lattice a holomorphic C uh, VOA with a certain very special H. And then you do the Z2 symmetry, you, you know, just like a moonshine, which you know that for any, uh, if it's a boson, all it says is that the topological twist is a, uh, a integer, but the integer can be zero or, or two, and that will make a difference for the conformal field theory. So that's basically the back and the forth, which are not the inverse of each other. But your characters satisfy some modular differential equation? They do. They satisfy all the things you can, all the early constraints, they do I satisfy. See. I see, I see. And now you know they, they, they are real. So, so they, they are realized by conformal field theory. So it's a real theory. I see. Okay, thank you. So Zhenghan, what is the current status on the, uh, this exotic MTC, the, uh, what's that called, Higer group? Yeah, so uh, actually I was, uh, uh, I think at this point, we still don't know it can be realized. And uh, 
you can calculate all the characters you know, they are supposed to be and uh, you know all the things uh, you know they supposed to happen but still we don't have a construction of the vertex over the algebra or local conformal net and uh, I think there's another interesting point which is you realize the double hug group is not an isolated fact Right. Actually, uh, it's corresponding to a odd prime number three. Uh, there are generalizations of five and seven all the way in 23, I think. Uh, they all exist, the module tensor category. So I think the most satisfactory answer to this question would be two mathematical theorems. One is for every odd prime P, there is a module tensor category which generalize uh, the double hug group. And secondly, they are all realized by chiral conformal field theories. And uh, I think at this point, I strongly believe this is true, but at the point, you know, we still don't know. And I also, th very hard for me to believe you can prove the existence for this particular theory without proving a general thing. <laughs> But by, by like construction, like the, the example of extremal semion theory you mentioned, it was, you start from some lattice uh, and then you do some gauging, right? But if such a construction would exist, it probably just meant that the theory is not exotic. Right? So it has to be something totally different. You mean the, the CFT I described is not exotic? Well, n well, not exotic in the sense that, you know, I don't know, when, when we say exotic CFT, I guess we mean that, it, that you cannot get it from gauging, orbifolding, whatever, of some kind of Western window witten like or you know, lattice theory. Okay, okay, I, I agree. I'm, I'm not saying, uh, so here, I, I, if I understand, you know, so I don't believe there's anything exotic. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing which I, I think the only thing I would say exotic in this seminar theory is that the, there are very interesting not yet discovered symmetries on positive definite even lattices of high dimensions. Right. Oh, and I, I, those exotic anomalous symmetries are interesting. Yeah. And they are responsible for non-lattice extremal CFTs. And uh, I don't necessarily believe those are exotic CFTs, but just I say it's a new phenomena that there are exotic symmetries. Yeah, I was more referring to the exotic MTCs, not the Higa group. Well, I, I, I start to believe there are no exotic MTCs. Okay. <laughs> it's just a matter, we don't yet know a construction of, uh, you know, conformal field theories. And uh, I, you know, I, I really, you know, think there are evidence from many different directions, including M theory, you know, I think those MTC, everyone has a corresponding conformal field theory. So there's nothing special about double hub group. It just, I think the, the way I consider, we think of double hub group exotics because we are still very much uh, you know, love, you know, Lie group symmetry, the algebra symmetry, finite group symmetries. Uh, we are not in expand yet into non-classical group symmetry. And that's actually, if you want to call that exotic, I would say, yes, that's true. But on the other hand, if we fully go into quantum symmetry beyond classical group symmetry, I don't think that's anything exotic. Can I ask <laughs> one more question? Uh, sure. So, I mean, is, is, is this construction, like the construction of the extremal semion, like a general one? Like, can I take some lattice and just figure out the condition, I would probably classify all the symmetries of this lattice and figure out the condition under which you know, I can uh, gauge and condense to obtain something uh, non-lattice? Yeah, yes, I, th I think actually, you know, first, uh, you probably know that, uh, you know, positive definite even lattice growth 
ridiculously fast. Right. So I don't think it's a, it's a human. I think you know, you went to a computer should do it. A quantum computer should do it. Yeah, yeah. Enumerate them. So I think that's out of the question to enumerate them all. That's why this question is hard. You know, when you go to 32, 48, I think it's definitely a very interesting mathematical question to ask. You know, if, you, if you're asking what's interesting about a monster group, and uh, one interesting thing about a monster is there are tons, tons of involution inside the monster finite group. And I consider that, you know, phenomena has a generalization in high dimension, positive, definite human lattices. There are lots of exotic Z2 symmetries. And then you can use those to construct very interesting holomorphic VOAs. Mm -hmm. And then you, the, you know, realization of non-trivial model tensor cadre from here by Aubrey Field, you know, go, you know, gauging, that's just a small thing. The, the real interesting question is lattices with exotic symmetries. And that's actually would also be related to the best possible quantum error correction code, like a triple E one, you know, those kind of things. Thank you. So, Chengwei, you were unmuted for a while. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, the question is, what's the significance of non-lattice CFT and this extremal condition? So uh, that's, you know, come from part of, uh, you know, I'm interested in physics. So the, you know, if you think about bulk edge correspondence, uh, you can ask the question, uh, you know, the, in this picture, the bulk topological phase of matter is a module tensor category. The boundary is a conformal field theory. And you can ask the question, what is the most stable possible edge a topological phase of matter can have? And I would guess you want the conformal field theory have small central charge and uh, you want uh, the HI, the conformal weight, to be small. And uh, that's actually played into this extremal, uh, the non-lattice thinking. So I basically consider non-lattice extremal conformal field theory boundaries as something interesting with respect to stability. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's what I was thinking about, actually. I don't think there's a mathematical theorem to justify everything I said, but the question inspired my thinking is, what is the most stable conformal edge of a top particle phase of matter without symmetry? Um, yeah. I have a related question, yeah. which might be rather naive. So, Gerald Hong defined a notion of extremal BOA, and later on, we can also discuss it in the context of three dimensional gravity, EDS. Yeah. And is that the same notion as extremal? No, it's not. Actually, uh, okay. I should have said that, but we did say that in the paper. I see. Uh, it's a different notion. Okay. So maybe you should tell us uh, when you have the papers or do you have a new paper or is this? No, the, the opinion paper is already out. And you, you're working on another one? Well, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I consider this would be my next uh, project for the next 10 years. So I think <laughs> I, unless somebody could help you to prove this next week, uh, then I, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I consider this is a, well, first I consider this a billion uh, annual model of thinking. It's a dead end. Uh, there are no way to generalize this approach to realize all model tensor categories. And uh, so I'm really looking for a new approach. But on the other hand, I do consider this open a different possibility, which is how to think about generalization of a moonshine 
to other groups. And hopefully in the end, there will be a generalization to all module tensor categories. So did any of the other MTC experts have comments? Yeah, I would love to hear any comments on possible approach or any question or comments. Well, I guess we should just thank you again, Jen Khan. Thanks, so much. It was a really interesting talk. Great to have you give it. And we look forward to the future outcome. Thanks, Arthur. Bye-bye. See you next Bye. week. Bye-bye.